It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Muli Ben Yehuda from IBM Research. I'll be talking about the Turtles Nested Virtualization Project. This is joint work with my colleagues Mike Day, Michael Factor, Tzvi Dubitsky, Nadav, Abel, Anthony, Orit, and Ben. All of us from IBM, some from research, some from the Linux Technology Center. So why don't we get started? What is nested x86 virtualization? What am, I what am I going to talk about? Quite simply, it is running multiple unmodified hypervisors with their associated virtual machines. So running um, VMware, Hyper-V, Zen, KVM, with whatever x86 operating, uh, operating system you would like to pick, such as Linux or Windows, simultaneously on an x86 machine, obviously. Um, as probably most of you know, x86 has some support for virtualization, for what we call single-level virtualization, but has no support for nested virtualization, running multiple hypervisors. Um, you're probably wondering, why would we want to do this? So let me give you a, a few good reasons, and then I'll tell you why the real reason why we did it. To begin with, operating systems are already becoming hypervisors. How many of you are running Windows 7? A show of hands, please. OK, a fair number of you. How many of you are running a recent version of Linux? Also a fair number. I actually don't know about um, the various um, Apple operating systems, but at least for those two, Windows 7 and Linux with KVM inside, these operating systems are, in fact, hypervisors. Taking Windows 7 as an example, with XP mode, when you run an XP application on a Windows 7 virtual machine, on a Windows 7 operating system, what Windows 7 does underneath the covers is simply run XP in a virtual machine. Now, let's work from that. Say we want to run Windows 7 in a virtual machine, and Windows 7 wants to run its own copy of XP inside its own virtual machine. Pretty much, we have to uh, support nested virtualization because our operating system is now a hypervisor. It would be nice to run other hypervisors in the clouds. For example, I'd like to run my own hypervisor in virtual machines running in Amazon EC Square for various reasons. Security. Let's say we want to build or study or run hypervisor-level rootkits. How do you do this without supporting nested virtualization um, and being able to run other hypervisors without being detected? There are reasons related to co-design of x86 hardware and system software. Um, there are various reasons, same as with single-level virtualization. You might want to test, demonstrate, debug, live migrate, other hypervisors. All of these, I think, are fairly good reasons, and certainly some of them were enough uh, for us to get funding for this project. However, the real reason we did it was because someone said it couldn't be done. So let me show you how we did it. OK, briefly, related work. Um, nested virtualization has been around for a while, since the 70s. Popek and Goldberg, Belper and Sue, Lauer and Wyeth all demonstrated different, or sorry, all showed different models for how you could do nested virtualization with certain assumptions, such as having hardware support for nested virtualization. The first implementation that I know of was done in the IBM mainframes, and again, it relied on the architecture having support for multiple levels of hypervisors. There was a really nice paper at OSDI 96 by Ford, Hibbler, and others um, called Microkernels Meet Recursive, uh, aka Nested Virtual Machines. But what they did was assume that you could modify every level of the software stack, every hypervisor, every operating system. Whereas what we're trying to do is do the same thing without modifying any of the levels except the lowermost um, hypervisor. There are various approaches to doing nested virtualization on x86. For example, Bergman's in his thesis showed that there are various software-based approaches and they're all horribly slow. Um, there was concurrent work with our work by Jörg, um, Jörg Rodel and Alexander Graf on adding support for nested virtualization to KVM with AMD's um, virtualization extensions. There is an early Zen prototype of nested virtualization done by He. And then uh, some of you might be familiar with the Blue Peel Rootkit, which is actually the first example that I know of, of nested virtualization on, on x86. This is a rootkit 
that in order to hide itself in um, a hypervisor level rootkit, that in order, order to run itself, uh, ran other hypervisors so they, it wouldn't be detected by the fact that other hypervisors couldn't be run. What is the Turtles project? What did we do? It's efficient nested virtualization, and I'll tell you just how efficient uh, as we go along with this presentation. It's for Intel x86 systems. It's based on the KVM hypervisor. It's fairly mature, um, at least for a research project. It can run multiple other hypervisors. It can run VMware. It can run uh, Linux. It can run Windows. And uh, the code is publicly available, if anyone's interested. It has four components. Every computer system has a CPU, so you have to nested virtualize the CPU. It has an MMU, and we will say that you have to take care of it by something we call multidimensional paging. It has, of course, I.O., although we often tend to forget about I.O. in research papers. Um, and we'll show you what we did for I.O. intensive workloads with something we call multi-level device assignment. And then, of course, we did a bunch of optimizations to make it go really fast. Unfortunately, due to lack of time, I will not cover them. Details, of course, are in the paper. OK, now we get to the heavier stuff. How does this work? Again, we make a difference, but we differentiate between multi-level architectural support, such as in the mainframes, where the hardware supports multiple hypervisors with single-level architectural support, which is what we have on x86, when the hypervisor only has a single level of hypervisor mode. You can run one hypervisor um, in x86 terminology. This is running in root mode, the most, privileged, um, the most privileged state of the system. But you can run many virtual machines. What we would like to do in the Turtles project is use that available hardware support to run multiple hypervisors and multiple virtual machines. And what we do is we multiplex the hardware, as, as is demonstrated in the figure, um, running both L1 and L2. A bit of terminology. L0 is the lowermost hypervisor, the one that is doing the nesting. L1 and L2, L1 is the other hypervisor, say VMware. L2 is a virtual machine. So L0 multiplexes the hardware between L1 and L2, running both of them as guests of L0 so that it can take advantage of the hardware support for running virtual machines efficiently without either of them being aware of it. This is a good point to mention that the scheme is generalized to n levels. We can do this for any number of hypervisors with certain assumptions. Our focus in this paper has been on the most interesting case of n equals 2. Let's talk about uh, the flow for a bit. And uh, this requires a bit of familiarity with x86 virtualization uh, to make sense of. I'll, I'll try to explain as much as I can as I go along. We have our L0 hypervisor. It runs L1, the other hypervisor, with something we call VMCS01. VMCS is Intel terminology for virtual machine control structure. It's the fundamental data structure that the hypervisor prepares describing the virtual machine and then passes along to the CPU to actually execute the virtual machine. So L0 runs L1 with VMCS01. And L1, which is itself a hypervisor, prepares VMCS12 to run its own virtual machine, L2, and then executes an instruction called VM launch to actually run it. Now remember, L0 is a real hypervisor. L1 is running as a virtual machine because L0 already, um, is already using the architected mode for hypervisors, which means that VM launch will trap and L0 will have to handle the trap. Now comes the magic. Remember, what we want to do is to have this multiplexing going on. We want to run L2 as a virtual machine of L1. So what L0 does is to merge VMCSs. It takes VMCS01, which describes how L1 is running, and takes VMCS12, which describes how L1 wants to run L2, and merges them into something we call VMCS02, which enables L0 to run L2 directly. One bullet, several months of work to get all the tiny little details working correctly so you can run the first instruction. OK, so we've, met, we've done it. We've prepared the VMCS. L0 um, now launches L2. L2 is running. And as virtual machines are one to do, it causes a trap. The trap goes to L0, which decides, do I handle it myself? 
sometimes, or more often do I pass it along to L1 because it's L1's virtual machine to handle. If it passes it to L1, forwards it to L1, lots of stuff goes on that I'll talk about in a bit, but eventually L1 will be done handling it, will resume L2, and then L2, L0 will run L2, and this whole process repeats. What about this? What happens here? Well, what happens here is that it makes angry turtle angry, and I'll explain why. To handle a single L2 exit, L1 does many things. It reads and writes the virtual machine control structure. It disables interrupts. It does all sorts of processing, which normally wouldn't be a problem because it's a hypervisor, it can do anything. But when it runs in, a, in guest mode as a virtual machine, all those operations trap, leading to what you can see here in the drawing, where a single high-level L2 exit or L3 exit uh, in the bigger circle causes many, many other exits. Now, for those of you who are familiar with x86 virtualization, you probably know the more exits we have, the less the performance we have. And this exit multiplication was the primary reason that people thought you simply could not do efficient nested x86 virtualization. You're going to take too many exits. Um, what you do, what you have to do, is to both make a single exit fast and reduce the frequency of exits. And I'll talk about both of these in a bit. Um, you also have to do, or we had to do another thing, which was pray that this will be sufficient. Let's talk about how we virtualize the MMU to cut down on the number of exits. We did something we called multidimensional paging, and I will very briefly explain how it works, probably in insufficient detail, but I will try. Basic idea, with n equals two nested virtualization, we have three logical translations from an L2 virtual to physical address, from an L2 physical to an L1 physical, and from an L1 physical to an L0 physical address. Three levels of translation. However, we only have two tables, two MMU page tables in hardware with hardware that is called EPT, which is available in newer processors. And this can take us from virtual to physical, and then from something we call guest physical to host physical. We have two, we need three. What do we do? We compress the three translations on, uh, onto the two tables so that we go from the beginning to the end in two hops instead of three. How do we do this? First, something we call shadow on shadow, which is the baseline. It's not interesting because it assumes no EPT table, which um, newer hardware does have, but um, it is useful for old machines and as a baseline. The idea is that um, each of the hypervisors, L0 and L1, will maintain something called a shadow page table, which they do today for their uh, virtual machines. And then L0 will take these two shadow page tables, and in addition to the third table, the guest page, the guest page table, will compress them into a single um, 0 2 shadow page table. For those of you who are not familiar with shadow t page tables, this probably d doesn't make much sense, um, but unfortunately, I couldn't find a better way of explaining it in such a short time. So assume you know what a shadow page table is, and let's talk about shadow on EPT, which is better. This is what happens when you do have um, two translation tables in hardware. And what we do here is we use one table as we normally would to run L1 with something we call EPT01, and then we tell L1 just to use your regular shadow page table to run L2, and that works. However, every maintaining shadow page tables is expensive. Every L2 page fault is going to cause this exit multiplication that we talked about, and performance here is not going to be very good. And now we come to multi-dimensional uh, multi paging. And the key observation here is that EPT tables rarely change, whereas guest page tables and shadow page tables change quite a lot. So again, we compress the three levels of translation into two tables, but now we pick more, more intelligently how to use the two tables. One table we use for the guest page tables without any changes, and this immediately means that guest page faults, L2 page faults, go all the way to L2. The other table, we compress two EPT tables, EPT01 and EPT12, onto a single EPT table, EPT02, and the reason this, uh, to do this, we 
L0 emulates EPT4L1, and the reason this works much better than what I just showed earlier here is that the EPT table changes rarely. Key takeaway, the, the details of how we do this are in the paper, and probably that is not, it, even that is not really sufficient for understanding this, so there is the code, and I'll be happy to talk uh, with anyone who's interested in this uh, at length. But the key takeaway message is we want to cut down on the number of exits, and we're, um, wherever you have to track the changes in the different virtual machine hypervisors page tables, you're going to pay a cost. So you want to track the tables that change the most, and you want to track them, th uh, sorry, that change the least, and you want to track them um, in, in the... Um, in the most efficient way that you can do this, and this is what multidimensional paging does. Okay, let's talk a bit about IO virtualization. Three fundamental ways of giving a virtual machine access to IO. One is you emulate the device. This is what um, VMware has done since its inception, um, very common, extremely poor performance. Or, you have a para-virtualized driver, which is a driver that knows it's running on a hypervisor, uh, which is what, again, VMware, Zen, KVM, all hypervisors do today, and you get better performance. However, there is an even more performant way, and that is direct device assignment. Basic idea, very simple. Give the virtual machine access to the I.O. device, the real I.O. device, directly, bypassing the hypervisor. You get better performance because there is no hypervisor involvement on the I.O. path. However, the trick is how do you do this efficiently? So we said you get the best performance, but to do this um, safely, you need something called an IOMMU, which I hope most of you are familiar with for what comes next to make sense. And uh, direct assignment requires an IOMMU. With nested virtualization, even for N equals 2, we have three times three different options for how we do I.O. virtualization. We could do one thing between L2 and L1, and then something else between L1 and L0. We were naturally most interested in the only option which didn't work out of the box, and which should give the best performance, which is multi-level device assignment, where we use device assignment both between L2 and L1, and between L1 and L0, um, in effect, giving L2 access to the physical platform device bypassing both, bypassing both hypervisors. To do this, we had to deal with um, memory mapped I.O., with programmed I.O., with DMA, and with interrupts. I will not talk about the first two. The details are in the paper. I will not talk about interrupts now. I'll talk about that in a bit. I will talk about DMA. Basic idea is that each of the hypervisors, L0 and L1, needs to use an IOMMU to allow its virtual machine to access the device and bypass it safely. However, we only have one platform IOMMU, so L0 has to emulate an IOMMU for L1, and doing this efficiently is a whole other paper that we're working on. Then L0 takes these two logical IOMMU, these two logical levels of translation, and again compresses them onto a single IOMMU um, translation table available in hardware, making it possible for device DMAs to go all the way to L2's memory space. L2 programs the device directly with these direct PIOs and MMIOs that I'm not talking about, and then the device DMAs directly into L2's memory space. And again, note I'm not talking about interrupts. What happens there? I'll talk about it in a bit. Okay, so that is the gist of what we did. Now let's talk a bit about um, how well it did. As I mentioned, we can run multiple operating systems, multiple hypervisors. We support SMP. That's all fine and well. What about the performance? We've looked at several benchmarks. Um, Kern Bench, for example, which is a compilation type workload. SpecJBB, which is a JVM type workload. And NetPerf, which is an IO intensive benchmark. And then we evaluated um, the contribution of multidimensional paging the contribution of multi-level device assignment. We looked at um, different L1 hypervisors, and we looked at a um, synthetic worst-case micro benchmark that shows that in the worst case, we really suck. But I won't show you these numbers. They're in the paper. I will show you the, the better numbers. For example, um, to be fair, I'll show you the better numbers because they represent 
real-world workloads, whereas the case where we really suck is a synthet synthetic worst-case benchmark, which is not a real-world workload. Um, let's look at current bench, for example. When we run current bench on the host, it takes 324.3 seconds. Lower is better, obviously. Um, when we run it in a virtual machine, it takes 355 seconds, which is a 9.5% um, overhead. When we run the same current bench with two levels of virtualization in a nested virtual machine, it takes 406.3 seconds, which is an additional 14.5% of overhead. Remember that exit multiplication? So first of all, it's not as bad as we feared. And the reason why is actually quite simple. Real-world workloads do more than just cause exits. They actually do useful work. But they do cause, at least current bench, causes enough exits to uh, make the 14.5% worse than the 9.5%. So we looked at the exit multiplication, um, and we saw that there were two instructions that caused most of the um, mul multiplicative effect. And those instructions were VM read and VM write, which L1 uses to modify the L2 VMCS. Now here's what happens. On Intel, these are special instructions that although all they do is mo read and write the VMCS, are implemented as trapping the instructions, whereas on AMD, these are simple loads and stores. So we um, hacked it so that they did not cause a trap and modify the VMCS directly, or read the VMCS directly, and that immediately got us down to 10.3%, whereas before we were at 14.5%. Um, I'll skip the spec JBB results for lack of time. The um, takeaway from these numbers is that each level of virtualization adds approximately the same overhead, which I think is a pretty cool result. Multidimensional paging, briefly. The effect depends on how many page faults your workload has. For something like NetPerf and SpecJBB, which do not have relatively to the rest of the workload a lot of page faults, we get a small improvement, very small. For something like KernBench, again, again, compiling the Linux kernel in a loop, lots and lots of page, ben, uh, of page faults, you can see that multidimensional paging gives you a really nice 3.5 times improvement. Let's talk about multi-level device assignment for a bit. I don't have time to cover all of this graph. Let's just focus on some of the more important things. Leftmost side, we see the performance of NetPerf on native, on bare metal. Dark gray bar is throughput, megabit per second, um, on a gigabit ethernet. And the light gray is CPU utilization. Let's focus on the cases where we reach, line, um, we reach line rate, which are native. And I will skip the single level virtualization cases and just look at the nested virtualization cases, which are direct virtio, the second one from the right hand side. And then the last one on the right hand side, the direct direct case, also known as the multi-level um, device assignment. So two things. First, we see that direct direct gives a nice boost compared to the second best option. But having said that, native takes 20% CPU utilization and direct direct, which, is I, which I want to remind you, basically means no hypervisor involvement on the I.O. path takes three times as much. Why? The answer is that interrupts, highly unfortunately, with, with current x86 hardware, cannot be injected safely directly to the virtual machine. They go all the way from um, the L0 hypervisor to L1 to L2. Again, the exit multiplication effect in between. So what we did was, OK, let's say we had a way of injecting interrupts directly to the guest. And uh, this is something that can be done. Um, what kind of improvement would we get? And to look at that, we simply implemented in the virtual machine a polling driver that takes no interrupts. And the answer is, this, this is the, the two higher lines, is that we get within 7% of bare metal, so really close to the optimum. Can't improve this much further. 
The key takeaway message is that um, if your driver is smart and not using too many interrupts, multi-level device assignment gets close to um, the optimum. If your driver isn't smart and using lots and lots of interrupts, you need a better way of injecting interrupts directly to the virtual machine, and then you can get very close to the optimum. In any case, it's still pretty good. I mean, in absolute numbers, um, we still fill the one gigabit pipe with 60% CPU utilization from a nested virtual machine with two, level of two levels of virtualization in between. Okay, to conclude, Efficient nested x86 virtualization is challenging, but it is feasible. It opens up many exciting things that you could do in areas such as security, the cloud, um, computer architecture. How do we get those interrupts to go directly to a level N virtual machine safely? We, have, we see current overhead of 6 to 14 percent for something that is not I.O. intensive. This is negligible for some workloads, but not yet negligible for others, and we expect to get to below 5% eventually. As I mentioned, the code is available, and that just leaves us with one small matter. Why is it called the Turtles Project? And the answer is a story. They tell a story about a scientist, some call him, some say it was Bertrand Russell, who was giving an astronomy talk um, in London. And he was talking about the um, layout of the galaxy, that the Earth revolves around the sun, etc. And uh, at the end of the talk, this little old lady stood up and said, everything you've told us is rubbish, young man. Everyone knows the Earth is a flat disk on top of a turtle. So he gave a superior smile and asked, well then, what is the turtle standing on? And she said, you're very clever, young man, very clever but it's turtles all the way down. And with that, I'll take questions. Hi, uh, Tim in Citrix. Uh, that's uh, great work and very encouraging that you've got about a 10% overhead and then another 10% for nesting. Do you have any feeling about how that's going to scale as your number of levels increases? Um, yeah. My hope is, based on the numbers that we've shown, this is why I find the fact that we each additional level, the second level added approximately the same overhead, that we're going to see the same thing with additional levels. Approximately the same. However, the exit multiplication effect is going to get worse with each level. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to continue the work to get the overhead for each exit and the frequency of exits down so that we can indeed only get the same overhead for each level. Thank you. Hi, uh, Nathan Taylor, UBC. Uh, again, this is very cool stuff. Um, I had a question about, um, excuse me, uh, about the security application that you, mm -hmm. uh, you gave at the beginning, um, particularly as a uh, as it pertains to hypervisor rootkits like Blue Pill, um, two questions which are kind of duels of one another. Um, you can imagine a hypervisor wanting to subvert Blue Pill by checking whether, using some heuristic to de determine whether it itself is running in a hypervisor. So, do you anticipate that for the general, um, for general unmodified, do you, are you confident that you will still be able to run this under arbitrary unmodified hypervisors while still uh, protecting against Blue Pill? And I don't know exactly that much about the internals of Blue Pill, but it's my understanding that it uses um, I.O. channels to get to the MBR. So given that you're kind of smearing together the N layers of abstraction to the physical I.O., um, are you confident, and this may be in the paper, are you confident that uh, Blue Pill just wouldn't um, infect the lowest level hypervisor? Okay. Complex question, I'll try to answer, Sorry. but no, that's perfectly fine. That's even uh, welcome. Um, first question first. With regards to detection, there's a really nice paper by Garfield, Garfinkel and others, um, maybe also some of the people here in the audience, says that compatibility um, is not enough to evade detection in the general case. So I'm not advocating that we'll be able to evade detection in any case. In fact, I'm not advocating rootkits at all, period. <laughs> Uh, I just gave it as an example of a potential case where nested virtualization could be interesting. Sure. That's the first question. 
Second one, um, I'm not sure I understood it, actually. Okay, uh, so more. let's imagine that we have some tier of, we have uh, hypervisors within hypervisors. Uh, how can we convince ourselves that instead of blue pill infecting the L2, it's not just jumping straight to L0? Okay, I think the answer here um, is along the lines of the dynamic and static root of trust with the uh, trusted platform model and all of that stuff that you need to make sure that whatever came before you is trusted. Now that has, that, that is an entire minefield with regards to privacy, with regards to a lot of other subjects. So I'm not sure that's a good answer, but it's, I think it's the only answer that we have right now. And clearly um, we should think about it some more. Thanks a lot. Hey, um, this is Saurav Bansal from IIT Delhi. Uh, very interesting work. Um, you mentioned that uh, you reduce the overhead from 14% to 10% by playing tricks with the VM read and VM write instructions and the VMCS. I was wondering, uh, will it help? I mean, how much will binary translation help in such a scenario? Do you think there's hope? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and in fact, we, we do discuss slightly binary translation in the paper. Um, I think it will help. I think we basically have two ways of solving this problem which is either we get the, uh, the hardware support that we need or we do binary translation. However, doing binary translation for this case is not trivial for um, a number of reasons. First is, um, well, it's complex and we can talk about this more later, but it's hard to, you can't do an instruction by instruction replace in this case, so you have to do something more complex. I can explain why later. And uh, you also, when you do something more complex, remember, we're running an unmodified hypervisor. We have, n we have no knowledge of its layout in virtual memory. So where do we put our code? And how do we do it in a way that is future-proof mm -hmm. for the next unmodified hypervisor? So that's a very interesting question that we've been struggling with quite a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank our speaker.